we want to welcome you to our 65th echo session uh, last week we were joined by dr patrick lungu our national tb program manager he mostly focused on the need to decongest facilities in respect to tb so the tb visits have actually reduced to to three so today we want to welcome all of you from our various folks in the network unfortunately because we are sitting on six screens we will just do a general welcome we want to won't name you name by name but thank you all for joining us today in the hub we have uh, members of the Ambian Pediatric Association. Uh, we have the presenter, Dr. Charlie Roitungu, the pediatrician, but he's joined by fellow experts, Dr. Mwinga, Dr. Kalima, Dr. Mumba. We also have Dr. Kozia, but we also have Professor Mpabalwani, and we expect somebody from Italy who's been taking care of, of pediatric patients. I believe his name is Dr. Datida. We'll ask him to speak for a bit. So thank you all for joining us and we'll go into today's presentation. Hello, I'm here. Actually, I'm Dr. Dantiga from Italy. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Thank you so much for... So, like, like was introduced, my name is uh, Dr. Charlie Chungu, Secretary General from ZPA. Um, I have no conflict of interest, but a disclaimer that this presentation had a lot of input from a lot of pediatricians, our cooperating partners, including CDC, WHO, and also we had input from program officers from the Ministry of Health as well. So the objective of today's session is that we're going to discuss the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children, we discuss the clinical course of affected uh, children, and we'll also outline some principles of management, as well as principles of prevention of transmission to children, as well as the reverse children transmitting. And we'll also just go through some interim proposed uh, recommendations coming from the association and also some from the ministry. Okay, so COVID-19, as we know, is a disease that's uh, caused by uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus type two, mainly affects uh, adults, so it's got an adult face, and there's really a paucity of data in children. So the little that we have is based off a few studies, but we know that there's so much coming in as research becomes more um, apparent. So in China, uh, children, 0.9%, in Italy, 1.2%, and then 5% in the US in terms of diagnosed cases. But we know that in the US, there's a lot more access to testing. The incubation period averages uh, 5.2 days, and the range is 2 to 14 days. But then we know that children are likely to shed the virus, even though they may be asymptomatic, and really that. Uh, makes them important in terms of the link, in terms of epidemiology, because then they're important in terms of spreading. So this slide uh, came from the Africa CDC, and, and it, it basically looks at uh, what the epi curve looked like uh, in other regions, in comparison to Africa. So if you see um, the golden line, um, it, it shows that's the Euro region. And you can see that around day 50, they had an exponential rise of cases. 
And so this was as of 1st of April. And so Africa was somewhere between 40 and 50. So what we can see there is really in the next few days to come, that's when we expect uh, to peak in terms of the Africa region. But we should commend the efforts that uh, the Ministry of Health, Cooperating Partners, and ZNPHI have been putting in place to really stop the spread of cases that will uh, drop that exponential rise from happening. So in terms of severity, we know that children in terms of disease severity are spared. But if you look at um, age and severity, uh, this slide shows us that the older the children are, the less the, the presentation is. But children less than one year have uh, severe symptoms. So by and large, uh, mild to moderate disease is the case with 90%. And then uh, for severe cases, it's, it's less than 10%. So like we said, children have milder symptoms and some of the postulated reasons are one, that uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, to receptor, which is the main mode of entry, is uh, less developed in children. Uh, another theory is also that with prolonged exposure, with repeated exposure, sorry, to infections, uh, children have um, uh, developed immunity, which offers cross protection against uh, uh, corona as well. There's also another theory that, that really the behavior pattern, if you look at the, the predominant mode of spread, it's been air travel. So we know that uh, uh, a lot of adults travel more in comparison to children. The fourth uh, feature is not really related to children, but we know that smoking in adults uh, due to nicotine-induced lung injury predisposes adults more. So like we said, in infants less than one year, there's uh, uh, they are at high risk for deterioration, and that's why they need to be observed closely. Uh, we have preliminary data coming in, but really, by and large, there's very few data in terms of settings that are similar to ours, which have high malnutrition and under five mortality. So that, that also is a challenge. So what does the case definition look like in terms of children? So for, for children, a suspected case is a child with ARI, acute respiratory illness, who has a fever and at least one symptom or sign of respiratory illness. We know that the predominant uh, symptom is fever in about 80 to 90 percent of cases, but then cough also is found in about uh, 40 to 80 percent, and so cough or shortness of breath, and travel to or residing in an area where there's a reported community uh, transmission of cough during the last 14 days before symptoms set in or a child with ARI who's been in contact with the confirmed or probable case of COVID in the last 14 days prior to symptoms, or a child with severe acute respiratory infection, fever, and at least one of the uh, symptoms that we talked about, cough or shortness of breath, who requires hospitalization with no other explanation that explains this clinical presentation. So a confirmed case is easy. It's, it's you know, a, a child or a person with confirmed lab confirmation of COVID irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms. So even if they are asymptomatic and you have lab confirmation, that's a lab confirmed, that's a confirmed case. But a probable case is a suspect case from whom test, uh, testing for COVID is inconclusive. So maybe the results from the lab are inconclusive or maybe for some reason the swab wasn't collected properly or maybe um, we, there was lab error, or a suspect case for whom testing could not be performed for any reason. Maybe we don't have testing, something like that. So we've been saying, what are the scenarios that children can come into contact with, uh, with COVID? So if the, ch the child comes into contact with someone who experienced the exposure two days before, uh, and the 14 days after the onset of symptoms, and this is really in relation to the incubation period. So if they came into face-to-face -face contact with a probable confirmed case within one meter and for more than 15 minutes, we've been told about social distancing, uh, which really should be a of a meter, and then direct physical contact with a probable confirmed case. The children are playing maybe in a, in a home 
and then they come into contact with someone who's COVID positive, uh, that would uh, suffice as a contact. Or if they come into contact with someone who's providing direct care for a patient with probable confirmed COVID-19 without using uh, proper PP. So other situations will be defined by the local uh, context. So triage is really very important and we'll give you a couple of scenarios of how uh, triage should be done. And this is over Archie. So this scenario in front of us is a hospital in York, where they start by assessing symptoms of patients. And really the symptoms that they start with is fever and cough because of, of, of how studies have shown their, their predominance. And so you separate people who have um, respiratory illness from people who don't, and then you classify those with respiratory illness according to their severity. So those who are severe are immediately triaged to receive immediate care. Those who are less severe are then managed according to local protocols, and we'll see what that looks like in the Zambian scenario. So scenario one is what is being practiced here at the University Teaching Hospital Children's Hospital. So there's a, a first contact uh, place. So really the, the first point is where there's case screening and triage. And then respiratory cases are then separated based on their COVID uh, risk. So those that uh, are, uh, are probable cases are then seen in a designated area so that you can limit transmission. And of course, staff have adequate PPE. And then those who need to be, um, who need to be isolated are designated in a, in a holding area while they are waiting for testing results. And when those come back, then they are then taken to the designated um, uh, COVID isolation uh, places for Osaka. And then respiratory cases who are less likely to be COVID suspects are also seen separately from the respiratory case, non-respiratory cases, so that you don't have um, uh, transmission of infections between the two populations. So that's just a, a, a picture showing where the initial screening is from. So it starts at the tent, and then from the tent, those who need to be seen in a, in a those who are probable COVID suspects then go to the back to clinic two. And then uh, there's further separation into respiratory cases and non-respiratory cases. Uh, scenario two is a flow chart, which is a, like a district level, health facility level scenario. And this, this particular flow came from uh, Kanyama First Level Hospital. So at Kanyama First Level Hospital, triage starts from the gate. So security personnel flanked by uh, public health personnel will then screen for respiratory symptoms and then triage patients either to ART, to the respiratory clinic, uh, or to the waiting area. And in all these places, infection prevention control measures are observed for strict respiratory and hand hygiene. And then in the respiratory clinic, um, they, are, they, are, they are then separated to see which ones would be likely to be COVID suspects. And then in ART also, the, the ART, if there's, there's further triage in ART, those who are found to have respiratory symptoms are also triage the respiratory clinic because we really don't want respiratory cases to be coming into contact with HIV infected clients. And then also in ART, those interventions are practiced as we'll allude to later when we look at the specific HIV recommendations in place of COVID. So the diagnosis is by nasopharyngeal swabs or pharyngeal swabs or uh, washes in ambulatory patients, but in our setting, we're using mainly the, the swabbing. Um, sputum or endotracheal aspirates or bronchial viola lavages may be used in patients who are with severe respiratory disease, and these are subjected to PCR uh, for COVID-19. And then serological assays are not recommended for the routine diagnosis of COVID. So as of uh, yesterday, there was no cure for COVID-19. As we know, uh, you know, evidence keeps coming in on, on a rapid basis. So, but they, however, there's a lot of work going in. There are a lot of trials. Uh, and Desivia is being uh, assessed for response even in, in children subsettings and then also Lopina Varitonavia, uh, chloroquine sulfate also is being assessed. So for, for now, 
uh, we don't have any cure known. So this mild cases uh, in other settings can be managed, uh, home management, but for now, in our country context, uh, mild uh, cases that are confirmed are still being isolated because we can manage to do that when we have a few cases. Maybe that will be revised later. So uh, really the mainstay is supportive and oxygen supplementation and the, the type of modality for oxygen support really depends on severity and what your um, respiratory status is. So if, um, for example, your SpO2 target is 90% and you can't achieve that with nasal prongs and you might need CPAP, you might need to escalate and intubate a patient. Uh, for patients in shock, you might need inotropic support uh, after giving initial fluid boluses. But bearing in mind that really in sick children, you don't want to give uh, judicious use of, you want to give judicious use of fluids because we know that too many fluid boluses is associated with uh, uh, adverse outcomes. So, like we said, for now, mild to moderate cases uh, are sent to an isolation area until you get a result, depending on the results, then you transfer appropriately. Um, severe suspected cases are treated according to uh, available resources in designation, uh, designated isolation areas, and confirmed cases are all referred to, uh, in this case, like for Lusaka, we have Levy and we have Balangi. I don't know if it's there another special position. The open for those that are active. Which, which makes sense. So this slide is the WHO criteria for severity. I know the text is a bit small, but uh, allow me to just highlight on the severity in terms of like severe pneumonia. So um, where you have bilateral opacities on chest imaging, Previously in the diagnostic criteria, there was if you have uh, ground glass opacities or bilateral opacities uh, on CT, but it's really not uh, prudent to do CTs on everyone. I remember uh, some webinar last week where people saying, even in pregnant women, it's not feasible to, to not just blatantly comes to the exposure and radiation. So uh, sepsis where, um, uh, which, which there's a category there based on uh, normal white cell count and uh, organ involvement, and then septic shock, where uh, in terms of uh, hypotension for children, the systolic BP should be less than the fifth centile or less than two standard deviations. And also there's a qualification for the heart rate being either less than 70 or more than 150, uh, prolonged CRT, capillary refill time, feeble pulses, tachypnea, so when you have signs like head bobbing, grunting, those are all signs that would make you think that this uh, child will have uh, severe uh, respiratory disease. So this one is a, is a question that people have been getting a lot to say, um, you know, because the mother-baby pair is, is what, 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 what is dealt with in pediatrics a lot of times. So, and the most, uh, by and large, the, the position of the Zambia Pediatric Association is that to the greatest extent possible, we would not like to separate a child from their caregiver. Of course, it's for a short period, but we do know the effects of uh, uh, separating caregivers and children. There's, there's issues in certain countries where at borders, they're separating mothers and children. And I think pediatric societies have come out very strongly and, and just advised on the effects in terms of development and, and brain welfare. But the most uh, important scenario would be where a mother is unwell and a child is well. In that case, if the mother is COVID-19, uh, it would be prudent to get a caregiver that the child might be familiar with, who can provide care uh, to this um, uh, child while the mother is being isolated. And if the child is unwell and the mother is, is well, it would be good for the mother to, to, to the greatest extent possible, um, uh, be with the child and the mother given adequate uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment, protect her from contract. So, um, in terms of now, key child programs, 
what are the considerations and the advice that uh, is coming from program leads? So for HIV, uh, there's some guidance that came from the Ministry of Health on, um, you know what, to really limit congestion in, in, in facilities and protect uh, from ongoing transmission. So there's the, the, the DSD criteria for children is currently sitting with the DSD task force, but there's been some preliminary criteria for child DSD that has been given, and that's that uh, children should receive at least uh, three months supply, especially those less than um, five years and then those older than five because their weight gain uh, uh, can be predictable they can be supplied longer like adolescents for example it would be six months so for children less than two years because they are followed up in MCH uh, they will receive uh, monthly ART and clinical reviews will continue um, for children on EAC enhanced adherence care they will continue to receive ART according to eligibility criteria but because of uh, coming in for repeated ESC monthly, maybe ESC can be done on phone, and this can be uh, adapted to local context in order to minimize contact with uh, health facilities. And then um, ART optimization needs to continue. For example, transitioning off the NNRTIs uh, to more potent uh, DTG-based regimens. So for children greater than 25, the guidance from the HIV program is that they can be switched to um, TAFET and given a six month, multi month scripting um, or dispensation. So, from the TB program, similarly, there is need also to avoid unnecessary visits. And so, to reduce contact, uh, all children on ATT should be checked on after two weeks by phone for assessment of compliance, treatment, response, and side effects. Those who are um, initiating. And then for those who are less than five years, the challenge here is that they rapidly gain weight and jump, change weight bands. So for, for these ones, they'll have uh, monthly reviews in the intensive phase and then two monthly reviews in the continuation phase. But for those uh, above five years, after initiation, the next review will be after they complete the intensive phase and should have two months supply of ATT. So really, they'll have uh, three visits, month two month four and month six. And at those visits, this is when they'll submit sputum uh, so that sputum results can either be communicated by phone uh, or uh, if they're not able to at the next visit, if there's nothing that flags. If the sputum result comes out positive, every effort needs to be made to really get in touch with these children so that the appropriate actions can be taken. Uh, sputum containers will be given advance, like we said, and then results will be communicated uh, by phone. So remember that child TB, usually the diagnosis is clinical and repeat sputum examination may not be necessary. And this advice also holds if a gastric lavage was the initial mode of diagnosis and if the child is improving clinically, there will be no need for us to be repeating. Okay. Thank you so much. So we'll take a short break and um, have some votes. So this is our first poll question. According to the current evidence, mothers positive for COVID-19 can go ahead and breastfeed their infants. Is this true or false? Um, according to the current evidence, Mothers positive for COVID-19 can go ahead and breastfeed their infants. Please go ahead and vote. We have a lot of people, so we expect more. This is interesting. I almost feel like you can't be wrong or right on this one because COVID-19 is very new. It's only months old. We are still learning, but for now, there's a correct answer. <laughs> okay. Very few people have voted. I'm sure Dr. Chungu is taking note. We'll discuss this further. We have 30 seconds to vote. Do we think uh, mothers who have should, who have COVID-19 should continue to breastfeed their children? Is this true or false? This is, I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> it's like almost 50-50. Some people feel it's true. Some people feel it's false especially when you say that people that are less than a year tend to get the most severe of diseases. 
So I guess uh, maybe that's why people think it's not. Okay, so we'll go ahead and end that. Uh, most people feel that it's actually true that they should not breastfeed. I'll end it and share the out. So this is how we voted. 61% of the NEPEC view that mothers who have COVID-19 should stop breastfeeding. Feel that they should not. Okay, so this is guidance that came from um, NATO unit and from the National uh, NATO coordinator. And uh, with, of course, with, with available evidence and what's around. So, um, if a mother is COVID positive or she's uh, a person under investigation, uh, or infection prevention precautions should be observed. So, standard uh, contact droplet precautions. So, either breastfeeding or expressed breast milk can be given to the baby depending on the condition of the mother while preserving, uh, observing precautions. Of course, we gave a scenario, if a mother is very ill, you know, then it's difficult to have to uh, breastfeed. So you need to make other uh, functions. But we know that we're a breastfeeding country uh, and, and to the greatest extent possible, uh, breastfeeding can proceed with as long uh, as PPE and other measures are, are put in place, some other hand washing and she's got that. So all neonates of uh, COVID positive or persons under investigation, mothers under investigations that need admission should be isolated from other neonates because of the chance of that neonate transmitting to other neonates in nurseries. We know that nurseries also can be a, 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 a night as for, for infection so there's no need for routine COVID testing um, immediately unless the neonate is symptomatic. Okay, and breastfeeding counseling uh, and psychological support should be provided because we know that the postnatal period is a very stressful period. Even mothers that don't have additional stresses sometimes can have postpartum depression in extreme cases even post uh, uh, psychosis. So uh, breastfeeding support and, and psychological support should be given. And then, as is uh, customary, BCG, OPV, and vitamin K can be administered according to the normal schedule. So we know there's been a lot of talk about BCG and maybe it could have a protective role in terms of uh, COVID, but the evidence, I think the jury is still out on that one and it's very compelling to be making recommendations based on that. So, this is the one area that uh, I'm told keeps receiving a lot of questions, like what is the child health guidance? What should happen in under five clinics uh, now that there's COVID? Because we know that uh, there's a supermarket model in, in, our, in our under five clinics. And, and so this guidance also was supplemented by the child health unit. Uh, so the consensus and also uh, looking at the evidence that's coming in from the World Health Organization. So all service points should practice infection prevention measures, so physical distancing, wearing of surgical masks and hand hygiene. So some facilities uh, in Lusaka have started doing that. There's one facility where in MCH, mothers are being allowed five in at a time, with one meter apart, while the others are outside, really to, to ensure that the, the risk of transmission is reduced. And then creation of more outreach points multiple sites is encouraged to avoid overcrowding. So time and days for services should be extended to avoid congestion and services to be provided promptly so that we avoid patients from really spending longer time in, in facility. And then all points should conduct screening of all clients for COVID-19. For example, if you remember the triage, the scenario two that we gave, the, the Kanyama model, these clients would have passed through the gate and would have received uh, an initial screening and then gone to their respective service delivery point if they uh, went through that triad. So uh, health promotion sessions, these, the guidance from the child health unit is that these be suspended until further notice and uh, growth monitoring and promotion, routine weighing and height measurements be suspended in the interim 
except where there's visible wasting or edema and or edema, uh, so that we, we, we really pick up um, our nutrition, which is a, one of our big child health programs. Yeah. And then programs offering feeding to OVCs should continue while observing uh, the strictest infection prevention measures. Uh, the guidance coming from the Child Health Unit and indeed the World Health Organization that vaccinations need to continue. Usually when you have crises in times like this, we've seen from outbreak times like Ebola, is that when you suspend such services, you get a reemergence of diseases that you even managed to control. And then right now, our indicators dropped in terms of uh, EPI coverage. So really, that's one area where we need to ensure to the greatest extent possible that this vital intervention continues but should be provided in the safest possible manner. And then we need to ensure that HIV, EID, uh, EID services to proceed, as well as uh, ANC services, maternal retesting in MCH needs to continue because we know that we were getting escape positives from previously negative mothers according to our spectrum data. So that's one area where we also need more. Okay, so we have another poll question. Regarding immunization and COVID-19, which of the following is correct? Services should be stopped due to risk of transmission of COVID-19. B, can only be done at the hospitals, that's immunization. Routine weighing of children should be done on all children. MCH should reorganize in order to decongest facilities and provide services in a safe manner. E is none of the above. Okay, we can go ahead and vote based on that. Which of these is correct? Okay, regarding immunization and COVID-19. A, services should be stopped due to risk of transmission of COVID-19. Immunization can only be done at the hospitals. Okay, interesting. Routine weighing of children should be done on all children. MCH should reorganize in order to decongest facilities and provide services in a safe manner. And then none of the above. So we have 20 seconds more. Uh, I think you can see Dr. Shungu, some people feel none of this is true. Uh, while some people feel that immunization should only be done in hospital, a small portion of people. We have a few people that still feel that we should still continue to weigh and measure the heights of these uh, children. However, 91% of the people feel that MCH should actually be organized in order for us to decongest facilities and provide services in a safe manner. I'll end this call. I'll come back to it later. So it would be interesting to maybe through the chat box to hear the rationale that the other people providing alternate answers have could be that maybe they strongly feel okay. that certain services should be disrupted. So it would be very nice to hear what they what they think. In short, like people to support their answers. To support their, their answers. Yes, because especially that this question came after that segment, it should have been a 100% a, a poll. So we'll now look at the advice from uh, the association with input from the uh, respective uh, custodians of, of these uh, specialties and with input from really everyone to see what is the guidance in terms of general chronic pediatric condition. So, um, the third poll question <laughs> concerning management of asthma and COVID 19, which of these is correct? Which of these is true? Inhaled steroids should not be used. Nebulization should be highly encouraged. Use of metered dose inhalers with or without spacers should be recommended. Two weekly reviews should be encouraged to reduce acute exacerbation of asthma or of the above. I'm just gonna... Okay, so which of the following is true? Which of these is correct? Concerning the management of asthma, 
inhaled steroids shouldn't be used. Nebulization should be highly encouraged. Use of, okay, this was an error. Use of metered dose inhalers with or without spacer should be recommended. Sorry, we may be anti. E, two weekly reviews should be encouraged to reduce acute exacerbation of asthma, E of the above. So which of these is true? So Dr. Chung, you can see that you almost have a tie between C, which is the use of metered dose inhalers, with or without spacers should be recommended, and all the above. Some people feel all these are true, meaning they feel that we should not use steroids anymore of the beclomethazone on these kidneys. Some people feel that we should even review these asthmatics more during this COVID period. Okay, so some interesting um, answers. I'm sure you tell us the answer. So we're going to end the poll. I see people are still. Okay, so the, the overarching guidance really is that we need to limit the amount of time that people spend in health facilities and decongest appropriately. So for all conditions, the general guidance is really that if something can be managed outpatient at home, uh, it's, it's, that would be preferable rather because we know that health facilities are a potential place of transmission. So that's, that's just a general uh, guidance. And then uh, asthma, that's the one condition that, that, that I'm sure other pediatricians will say we've been getting questions over. Uh, caregivers of children who are asthmatic keep asking because we know that from the adult side, uh, those who, are, who have uh, pre-existing asthma are at risk for severe deterioration when they get COVID. So in terms of childhood asthma, uh, patients on immunosuppressant drugs should continue their prescribed medication using inhaled steroids. And, and the reason is because this, this really controls their asthma and prevents flare-up. So that will keep them out of facility. Because if they stop that, then uh, they will have repeated exacerbations that will keep coming into hospital unless the decision to stop is based on the step-down approach in the management of the child. So avoid shared nebulizers due to high risk of cross infections, and there should be a space there, and also aer aerosolization of particles. We know that even from the guidance from the WHO, Nebulization is one of those procedures that is aerosol generating. And so there's guidance that for that, if possible, it needs to be done in a negative uh, pressure room and also with, um, with uh, IPC measures adhered to strictly. And then metered dose inhalers, biospacers, is preferred during attacks. So usually when you use MDIs properly, uh, children can get out of attacks. And so that's the preferred uh, mode of uh, management. And then IPC, like we said, should be uh, optimized. And then scheduled hospital visits should really be minimized. And social distancing should be, um, should be what's the word? Adhered to. Optimeter? What's, what's the term? There's a term that uh, the ministry is using, not social. It's only meter. <laughs> So for diabetic patients, uh, uh, there was a question that why is this relevant? Well, because in tertiary hospitals, there are a lot of diabetic patients that are seen, as well as in clinics as well. Right? So minimum three monthly reviews, patients with poor glycemic control to be followed by phone between reviews, and sugar diaries are encouraged for easy follow-up. Insulin and other drugs should be given for three months, but we know for those types of insulin that still require refrigeration, uh, the healthcare workers need to explore those very carefully. And then for if, if they don't have, uh, we have some local recommendations for how to optimize storage, but where those cannot be uh, assured, caregivers can come to pick up prescriptions without the children coming into facility. Like we said, reviews can be done by phone. So the Reno, the Reno, um, um, the, the pediatric nephrologist guidance that for patients who are on CAPD, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, they can continue home-based dialysis with intermittent reviews by phone. Those on immunosuppressant drugs should have few scheduled hospital visits because of uh, being immunosuppressed and also practice social distancing. 
Uh, when you want to refer uh, uh, children with renal conditions to specialized units across the country, it's always best practice to consult ahead so that you avoid unnecessary travel for services that might not even be uh, provided during this time. And the decision to stop drugs should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. So from the cardiac team, uh, most of the children have unrepaired lesions and on medical treatment, so they are high risk group for COVID-19. Uh, in the adult population, there was talk of whether being on AC, uh, AC inhibitors or AC receptor blockers puts people like the enalapril, the losartans, put people at increased risk of contracting COVID because it's been noted that in those patients, there's upregulation of the AC ACE2 receptors, which is a mode of entry for the COVID. So again, there's not enough evidence to support that and extrapolating, it might be the case also for children, but really the guidance is that we need to improve access to antipedia drugs and benzatine prophylaxis at local clinics. So clinics advise to stock up on these drugs so that we prevent unnecessary uh, consultations and also uh, the, the unit has started conducting telephonic reviews three to six monthly, depending on condition and prescribing telephonically. And then post-op patients who are not on medication may be reviewed annually or every two years. Patients who are acutely unwell must be encouraged to seek medical help. And the reason is because they are at uh, increased risk of uh, deterioration. And so um, patients are advised to practice social distancing and if possible, wear masks when movements have to be made. Okay, so in summary, um, like we said, there's a bit of evidence coming through, but really there's not much. And so most of like you get case series of like nine patients, there's one systemic review, which systematic review, sorry, which, which aggregates most of the child's evidence around. And then children have lesser risk for severity for the reasons that we alluded to earlier. And children also have a role to play in stealth transmission or rather silent transmission because of being asymptomatic. And that's why the guidance to close schools has rationale so that you don't have kids moving about unnecessarily. And we really need to limit them visiting grandparents and things like that because then they are then a nidus of spreading. Management is supportive with no currently approved medication. And then uh, infection prevention is critical to prevent facility and community spread. And then all children's clinics or interventions should respond to MOH COVID guidance. So we end with the quote, the moment you have protected an individual, you have protected society. So with this, it's incumbent upon each one of us to really uh, practice um, uh, IPC, social distancing, and the collective result of that is that we would have um, helped to protect Zambia against the spread of COVID. So I'd like to... Yeah, thank you so much. That's uh, a lot of education. And if you've never believed that quote, I'm sure now with COVID-19, we all do. So I think we'll go into, before we go into a brief uh, Q&A, we'll ask Dr. Datiga, I hope you can unmute yourself. Please, any comments about your experience in Italy, which we know has had a lot of cases of COVID-19. And interestingly, Dr. Chungo, as of yesterday, we had reached 1.2 billion people with uh, COVID-19 confirmed. That's a, they got a test. That's actually the number of people living with HIV in Zambia. And it's increasing. You know, I think at first we were thinking, no, it won't come to Zambia. And we know that the mortality seems to be a bit more than what we anticipated. And if we get half of the world's population uh, infected with COVID-19, that mortality actually translates into millions. So this is a, it's a very serious issue. We'll let Dr. Datiga, uh, uh, Dr. Sikoni, thank you. This is yes. <laughs> thank you for joining us and introducing us to Dr. Lorenzo Dantiga. Uh, Tom, it's you a want, pleasure. You want to introduce Dr. Lorenzo? Well, yes, Dr. Lorenzo is um, the director of one of the largest important uh, pediatric hospitals in uh, Italy, but uh, we may say in Europe. 
is a pediatric gastroenterologist, but he's also an intensivist at the same time. And uh, in this moment, he is uh, living in the hotspot of the coronavirus in Italy, Bergamo. I'm sure you might have heard from the news. And um, well, I, I hope he will not blame me for saying that because he has a very, how can I say, it's a very humanitarian heart, a very Christian heart. He's also doing a lot of calls for adults, adult patients with COVID. So he has really a direct experience, not only as a pediatric director, but also as a physician taking care of adult patients. So now I let Lorenzo speak. And greeting to everybody. I'm very happy to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Lorenzo, please uh, go ahead and give us an overview right. of your experience. Okay, can, can you hear me well? We can hear you very well, actually. Okay, thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, for this invitation. Um, actually, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ornella Ciccone. She's a very good friend of mine. We train together. She, she's actually like my sister. And... Um, and I'm very happy to share with her this, uh, this day with you. Uh, she actually invited me to Zambia a few years back. So I, I've been to Zambia some 15 years back and I also visited UTH. Um, so I'm particularly happy to be here with you uh, today. Um, I, I think the presentation was very thorough, very comprehensive. And I would say you covered everything about uh, COVID-19 in children. So if you wish, uh, wh what I can do is sharing our own experience. And um, if you like, I could say a few words about uh, our recent experience, which has been uh, really uh, a hurricane coming to Italy and especially to, to our region, which is the Lombardy region in the north of Italy. So if you wish, I can tell you something. I, I could also share uh, a few slides, if you like, uh, uh, to tell you what we experienced here. Um, just let me know and I will go ahead. Please go ahead. That's fine. All right. So I think uh, um, a, a, few, uh, a few information. I, I'm going to, uh, if you want me, uh, if you want me to share my screen with, uh, with the slides, just let me know. And I think you would like to enable uh, my, my screen sharing. Um, the first, um, the, the first uh, I think, uh, important uh, issue is the case definition in children, because as you know, the case definition uh, in general and by the WHO is based on uh, symptoms. But we really know that children do not uh, have symptoms um, uh, most frequently, although they, they can get infected. So whereas in, in adults, uh, the suspected case is a case with some respiratory symptoms, fever, uh, in children, at least in our experience, that should not be the, the, the main point. Um, actually, we, um, we have uh, prepared a triage uh, schedule uh, that uh, um, try to divide the patients according to the suspicion of COVID-19. And for us, what was important was the epidemiological aspect, so the contact rather than the symptoms. Uh, and I think that's a key point. Uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, dividing patients uh, uh, according to this uh, we actually found uh, many children coming to the hospital for other reasons who were carrier uh, of uh, COVID-19. So most of, of our children, we, we diagnosed some 20, 20 children uh, with a nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal swab, but, uh, but 18 were admitted for other reasons. So they had no respiratory symptoms whatsoever, uh, whereas only two had mild respiratory symptoms. So the first point, is, uh, uh, is the criteria to suspect uh, a COVID-19 positive uh, child. I think the, the contacts, uh, the family contacts, uh, the area they are coming, you know that in Italy there are uh, cities uh, that are called red zones with high endemicity. Uh, so the epidemiological more than the, than the clinical aspects are important. And, and this is one issue. Um, a second issue is, uh, is that uh, uh, it is very important uh, to be aware that COVID-19 uh, as, a, as a preferable 
intra-hospital dispersal. So if you admit a child and you, you don't know if the child is positive and actually the child is positive, you will have a diffusion, intra-hospital diffusion of the, of the infection. And, uh, and this, this infection uh, really uh, has as its main outbreaks within the healthcare facilities. Uh, so if you look at China, but also if you look at Italy, uh, probably the, the places where the, where the virus spread it uh, most were the healthcare facilities. So isolation of the cases within the hospital, avoiding to admit patients who, who do not need to be admitted is really paramount. Uh, as it is paramount, the use of uh, personal protective uh, equipment, which, is, uh, which has been missing actually, or, or, or were insufficient during, during this uh, sudden uh, outbreak in Italy. Um, if you Dr. wish, Lorenzo, uh, yes. You can yeah. use your, please share your screen as you speak. Very interesting. Uh, sorry, uh, could, could you repeat for me? Where, did you have a question? Or, or you, could share, you could share your screen. I think there's a green button. Uh, okay, it says that, that, uh, uh, that it is disabled. It says it is disabled, I think. It says it's also disabled. Uh, okay, just go ahead, it's fine. It's okay. All right. Um, I, would like, I would like to share another issue. Um, or, or I might tell you, well, uh, another issue regarding children is that probably, uh, as you said, children are, are not affected. Uh, they don't have a uh, relevant clinical problem. At least uh, children probably between, uh, below 14 years of age. Uh, apart from the, the infants, we have just uh, submitted a paper on infants uh, with the COVID-19 infection. And actually in the first three months of age, um, children uh, who got positive uh, uh, may present with a sepsis-like uh, picture. We had uh, some 10 of our 20, 22 patients. They were infants uh, below three months. They came to the emergency department uh, with, uh, with fever and a sepsis-like right. picture. So the first approach was that you, you would uh, give to, to a neonatal sepsis um, because they had temperature and they looked really, really with, with some uh, cardiovascular compromise. But in fact, these patients don't have a, um, a severe course. Just with the supportive treatment, uh, these children get better soon. And none of our patients had uh, complications. Actually, in, the, in a couple of two, three days, they, they got better and, and everything uh, resolved. But the picture, the presentation was really uh, different from uh, older children. Uh, older children can have some respiratory symptoms, some pneumonia. You, you would pick it up uh, if, you, if you do a chest X-ray, certainly if you do a CT scan in, in the older ones, but, but it is relatively uncommon. I think it is important to, to be aware that the infants can present differently. Um, Another, uh, another issue is uh, immunosuppression. Um, you know, in, in my center, uh, we have many uh, pediatric solid organ transplant recipients because uh, Bergamo is the largest uh, center for liver transplantation and, and intestinal transplantation in children. So one concern uh, was, uh, was what happens uh, in the immunosuppressed children and also adults. So you, you might see that, uh, that also, uh, a letter from myself appeared in the literature saying something about that. And uh, what is interesting is that um, the severe disease we see in adults, which is a lower respiratory tract you know, interstitial uh, pneumonia, uh, is uh, actually caused by the host uh, innate uh, immune system rather than directly to the, uh, by the virus. So the virus is responsible for the infection and for triggering an immune response. But the lung, the lung uh, disease, the severe interstitial pneumonia, is caused by the host immune system. So I think it is important to realize that this, uh, this disease is different from other diseases. And the, most likely immunosuppression is not a, an, an additional risk factor. It might 
uh, actually be a pr protective, uh, uh, protective uh, you know, aspect uh, because, uh, because lung disease uh, is, uh, as I said, uh, an, uh, due to immune response. And this has been shown in many studies previously um, and also recently. Uh, if you look at uh, the, largest, uh, uh, the largest cohort of patients recently published in Lancet, you will see that there, are, there is also the report on all the cytokines in these patients. These patients have a cytokine storm. And, uh, and in fact, they are currently treated with uh, immune modulators rather than with antivirals. Uh, for instance, steroids are now come back uh, uh, to, to the clinic for these patients, although initially they were recommended against, but probably they were insufficient data. But uh, there are biologic drugs that, that we are using, and they seem to be effective. So uh, this is an important issue. I'm, I'm not sure it applies to HIV patients. We don't have many actually in our country, so I, I, would, I wouldn't go much far, farther with this, uh, with, with, with this issue. But uh, for sure, uh, transplanted patients do not have an increased risk uh, uh, if they are immunosuppressed. I don't know if you have... Uh, Questions. Actually, I think now I can share something, and if you okay. want me to go ahead, I will. I will show you a few data uh, uh, regarding my my hospital and uh, and our experience. Um, so, can you actually see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanted to to show what happened to my hospital during this outbreak. Uh, our hospital is a 1,000 beds, so it's a general hospital, big hospital, and currently 450 beds are occupied by COVID patients, and half of them are on the CPAP. So one of the major crises was to, uh, you know, transform completely our hospital into a COVID hospital. So many units uh, were were completely you know, uh, transformed into COVID units. For instance, the neurology, the gastroenterology unit. And, um, and, and also a challenge was to find out uh, CPAP systems because uh, at least half of these patients uh, need uh, CPAP. And, and oxygen, uh, the amount of oxygen we were using was so high that at some point we ran out of oxygen, actually. We had to bring an extra oxygen tank to the hospital because the hospital ran out of oxygen. And also 85 of the 100 ICU beds are occupied by COVID patients. And this was the main challenge because many patients requiring ICU actually didn't have the chance uh, to, to find a bed. So uh, this was very sad. We had to select uh, who was the patient uh, who deserved to, to, uh, to be resuscitated in intensive care and who was not. And actually that was selected based mainly on, on age. Um, we closed all the programs apart from urgent surgery, the oncology care and transplantation. And all doctors, including myself, uh, are doing shifts on the adult COVID wards because 30% uh, of the healthcare personnel was off sick with COVID-19. So th there, was, uh, there was the need of, uh, of more doctors to look after these patients. Uh, and 10, 15 of, uh, of these healthcare uh, personnel are actually inpatients uh, uh, on CPAP and, and some are also in ICU intubated. Uh, I think it is very important uh, from an epidemiological point of view, uh, uh, take a look at what, what happens when you apply the lockdown. So in Italy, as you may know, on the, on the 8th of March, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, decided that uh, we should have a home lockdown. So everybody should stay at home, locked in, apart from, you know, going to, to do shopping for, for the necessary food just, for, uh, just once a week. So uh, this is what happened uh, with the lockdown. The green bars are the number of patients coming to the emergency department, our hospital, uh, during, uh, during the last few weeks. Uh, so as you see, the COVID patients coming to our emergency department uh, have been uh, as many as 60, 70. But what is interesting that after a couple of weeks uh, or even less from the lockdown, 
the number of patients requiring admission and uh, respiratory support uh, decreased remarkably. So I think this is an important message. Lockdown works for, for, uh, to reduce the diffusion of, the, of this infection. Okay, this is, uh, I'm not going to comment on this because it, it might be a little bit complicated. This, uh, this will be published shortly in Journal of Pediatrics. It's our emergency department triage uh, for, for children. And um, as, you, as you see, uh, the, the main point for the suspicion of, uh, of uh, infection is actually the epidemiological a contact uh, rather than uh, the, the symptoms, which are anyway there. But it, the contact makes, uh, makes the patient particularly uh, suspected for COVID-19. So there will be an isolated waiting area and, uh, and the management with, uh, with the PPE. Uh, this is even more complicated, so I'm not going to tell you much, but, uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is our management uh, at the emergency department uh, in the, uh, at the triage, sorry. Uh, the, we have a tent as you showed actually. Uh, so this is the triage, this is the emergency room and the management. And maybe since you, you are recording, I believe, maybe you can take a look at, at this later and the, in the pediatric ward. Uh, what we've been doing uh, was uh, uh, taking swabs in all patients uh, admitted, patients and parents. So from March 6, uh, all admitted patients were tested for the reason I told you, be, be, because we want to pick up uh, asymptomatic patients. So far, 17 tested positive. Uh, there, there are more, but they were already admitted or they came from intensive care. But from the emergency department, 17 out of 60, more or less, tested positive. Uh, and uh, we also tested uh, those in the general pediatric unit. 14 were positive and six were infants, as I told you. Uh, we also tested three uh, in the oncology unit. And uh, interestingly, uh, three patients uh, were positive and they were uh, immunosuppressed actually because they were in because of fever and neutropenia following chemotherapy. Uh, in the transplant unit so far, we didn't pick up any positive patients, but we have uh, parent, parents, uh, positive parents. Uh, and, uh, you know, curiously, uh, the children are not positive. At the moment, we didn't pick any transplanted patients. Um, so only two of 17 were admitted for respiratory problems, which was, you know, mild to moderate respiratory problems, pneumonia. The reminders were symptomatic. And uh, I, I think that that's it. Yeah. Let me just go back. Uh, or or you, you can get back, I think, uh, the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lorenzo. I hope everyone was able to hear him, but I'll just give a brief uh, summary. So from the Italian experience with the pediatric population, it seems that an epidemiological uh, link is uh, quite critical rather than the, the clinical. So most children won't have symptoms. I know somebody in the UK, they brought in kids for testicular torture. On the theater table, they started coughing. They swapped them, they were COVID-19. So, which means they will play a critical role in transmission and your threshold for testing them should actually be quite high because they won't have symptoms. But the other thing is that because they don't have symptoms, they are more likely to spread because they'll be running around. So, you really should not be admitting kiddies that really should be home because they'll, they'll cause havoc. And um, the other thing is that for kiddies that are less than one year, unfortunately, they are more likely to get the most um severe infections and for those that are less than three months they almost come in with a sepsis like um syndrome you know fever and things like that and uh, the question has been or the postulation is that why are adults getting sicker than the kids maybe because of the mature immune system because most of the damage we are seeing the pneumonia is actually due to the cytokine storm that kids may not be very good at mounting so there are issues of the role of immunomodulators in actually um, treating COVID. And that's why people are talking about washing out, you know, dialysis, at the adsorption, that is you, you go and get all those cytokines, the interleukins out of the system, but that's a story for another day. But thank you so much. That was very, very helpful. A lot of pearls there. I really hope all of us got them. So thank you so much, but we'll allow some questions from our um, network. I'm sure there are a lot. Do we have any hands up? 
and before we as we will scan the network on the probable cases, the ones with the inconclusive results in the lab, because I'm aware of pediatric virology, you know, because it's very disturbing for me as a clinician when they say, oh, we are we are inconclusive, the result was inconclusive. Do you like to tell us a bit more when I send the swab to the lab and they tell me it's inconclusive? Because of course I don't know what to do with the patient. What's happening at the at the lab? Yes, it's okay to Thank you very much for that question, Doctor. I think uh, an inconclusive result does not say an inconclusive result is that the number of errors it could be due to the technique of collecting the swabs. We may have just collected saliva and really swapping the oral parts. Secondly, the teachers in the swab below cannot be picked by the test by the by the PCR technique. So it's very important that if the result is inconclusive, it has to be repeated. Thank you. Otherwise, the basic technique is that as the overall and the you, you may and you may be in a situation and you can get a different with that. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Palalan. We have last on. Please go ahead with your contribution. I've, got, I've unmuted you. Last on. Okay, thank you very much, Sombo. Uh, this is Dr. Stembo. Um, I think this is a very good opportunity to also inform the nation that initially the social distancing was the word. But now WHO has revised it from social to physical distancing because the whole intention is about keeping that physical distance and not keeping the social uh, linkage, WhatsApp, social media. So the difference between social and physical is about keeping the physical distance. So from now onwards, let's repress the social with physical distancing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll look into that, uh, Dr. Stembo. Thank you so much. Dr. Mpeta, do you want to say something as an adult physician joining in a pediatric session? Dr. Mpeta, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Oh, Bobo. Dr. Dr. Bobo. Bobo. Yeah, her hand is up. Dr. Bobo. I think she's talking, but I can't hear her. Dr. Bobo, please unmute yourself. I've unmuted her. Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you very well. Yes, um, I was saying that um, I thought uh, it was really a very good idea to to invite Dr. Lorenzo to give us um, a different perspective. And um, I just thought, I may, uh, my question is um, about immunosuppressants. Did he actually say that uh, they may actually be, uh, play a very important role going forward, looking at, what they, uh, looking at the results they have gotten uh, in children so far? And then, um, okay. th yes. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Then the issue of uh, physical distancing, I think I didn't get it clearly from my doctor at Tembo. I wasn't very sure what he was trying to say. Thanks a lot. Dr. Um, you want to say something? Yes, I, I want to add to uh, Dr. Bobo's question on the immunosuppressants being protective. I wanted to ask that, could it be that uh, immunosuppressed patients uh, exercise a lot of IPC, like, like if you have a, a transplant um, child, for example, even within the home, they will really have masks. And oh, I just want to find out if, that, if, if that, that was something that was considered, even in the case where maybe the mother is COVID positive. This is a child who usually, in, in your settings, probably walk around with a mask. You know, they will already be physical distancing. So would that be a factor also? Uh, yeah. So uh, about immunosuppressants, I, you know, um, I would like not to push it 
very very far because uh, <laughs> what yeah. I, what I'm confident with is that immunosuppressed uh, patients uh, have uh, did, did not show to have an additional risk factor. Uh, so I, I think we should not push it too far. But um, if we look at these viruses, these viruses are, are different. We have many immunosuppressed patients, and we'd, uh, we we had nightmares with influenza or with uh, adenovirus. These these uh, viruses are really uh, bad for our patients. But uh, uh, coronaviruses are different. If you look at SARS that occurred in 2003, uh, or MERS. Uh, uh, Two epidemics from uh, two other coronaviruses, and you look at the WHO data, you will see that uh, immunodepressed patients were were not at higher uh, uh, risk uh, to have uh, severe complications. So this is a, a study of what happened uh, in the previous uh, epidemics of coronaviruses, and also in the in the Chinese uh, in the recent Chinese experience with the SARS-CoV-2. So I think it is right to say so. Um, but uh, uh, it is sure that the lung disease is uh, caused by the immune system. But uh, I, uh, I don't think we are allowed now to say that immunosuppression should be given to patients uh, to, to, you know, to avoid this disease. Uh, although I can tell you that there are trials uh, on uh, patients with severe lung disease um, using certainly steroids or tocilizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-6, or other immunosuppressants. So I don't know exactly the reason, uh, if, if there are IPCs in these patients, uh, or, but it is quite easy to understand that uh, given the important immune uh, response that is the cause of lung disease, a patient who is relatively immunodepressed uh, uh, should not be at higher risk. And uh, I think we can guess that this might even protect the patient. But that is not demonstrated, and I would not push it too far. Thank you so much. I think essentially saying it's something that still needs to be studied. They've seen, they've seen a pattern, but as we know, correlation is not causation. So it's something, that's why there are drugs, the immune modulators, uh, the antibodies, the inhibitors, because we still want to explore this relationship further. It's a possibility. Um, Dr. Mumbai? You, Dr. Kalima, please go ahead with your comment about physical distancing. Okay, uh, can, you, can everyone hear me? So, um, Dr. Tedros came back and uh, came from um, uh, social distancing. Uh, they're not supposed to do things like that. Uh, so what they encourage is physical distance on the top. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalima. I believe there are some hands up there. The network is huge today. I'm actually struggling to see whose hand is up. If anyone has their hand up, please just unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, uh, we have Dr. Shala Chavala. Please go ahead with your comments. Yeah, uh, I had a question for Dr. Diantiga. I wanted to, to find out if there is any, if they've observed any COVID patients in, among patients uh, with uh, bronchiolitis, for example, because my, we are going into our bronchiolitis season the next three months, and whether it would be a good idea to look for it in those group of patients. Okay, um, we, we just had our winter here, so now it's spring here. So we had uh, several bronchiolitis uh, in, in, our, in, in our unit. Um, I would say no. Brocolitis is not a presentation of uh, COVID-19 infection in children. You know, it is, uh, I think it is really important to distinguish whether a patient uh, is sick uh, uh, because of COVID-19 or with COVID-19. Because there are many reports uh, uh, showing that, you know, patients had a very bad course, even children, and they were COVID positive. But uh, it, it is actually very important to distinguish whether COVID is just uh, 
you know, the patient is just a carrier or whether the, the actually the infection is causing the disease. For instance, uh, recently we admitted a child uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a asthma. Um, and uh, and the, the child was positive for COVID-19, but the picture was clearly that of hyperinflation, wheezing, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the, and the patient was positive, but uh, actually uh, was not oxygen dependent. Uh, he, had, uh, he, he had wheezing, so it was treated with, uh, with uh, the standard treatment for, for asthma. It yeah. responded very well. So you might say that that patient had, uh, had asthma at a, at a obstructive uh, crisis due to COVID-19, but I, I think that would be very wrong. So the answer is no, I don't think bronchiolitis can be uh, caused by uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much. We'll let, uh, I'm sorry, if you are using your device and you are not named, it's very difficult. Like Galaxy Note 9, your hand is up. You mm -hmm. can go ahead and unmute yourself. I encourage all participants, please rename your devices to your name. Uh, good afternoon. This is Dr. Veronica Molenga. <laughs> uh, sorry, I couldn't join in the echo room, but I've joined from my office. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. I've got a question for Dr. Lorenzo. Um, in the presentation uh, of COVID by infants, um, you mentioned that most of them presented with a sepsis-like picture. And I don't know if I heard you correctly, you were saying you only manage them symptomatically. But um, in our setting, um, we do have quite a lot of uh, infants presenting with sepsis. And uh, the current guidance is that actually, even as you are suspecting a child to have COVID, you should screen for the common uh, pathogens in your environment. So you should screen for common pathogens that cause pneumonia and that cause a sepsis in your setting and even start um, empirical treatment while you're waiting for the results. So uh, did, you, did I hear you correctly when you mentioned that uh, you treated these infants uh, uh, just symptomatically? No, I, I agree entirely with what you say. No, of course we manage these patients as if they were septic. So these patients uh, obviously got the same management of uh, of neonatal sepsis. So the standard, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic items uh, and uh, antibiotic treatment, of course. Uh, but at the end, these patients had very mild uh, inflammatory markers, and in two three days. Uh, they actually uh, resolved their fever. They had no complications, and they did very well. And they were and they tested positive. I think they had COVID-19 viremia, and I think there are many reports saying that under one year of age, uh, the picture can be more severe. Uh, but uh, I agree entirely with you. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not saying that we should not uh, uh, treat them as if they were septic, because some 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 will be septic, and the picture is the same. So absolutely in agreement. You, you manage them as if they, they're accepted. Oh, thank you so much. I believe, uh, okay, Dr. Veronica has already asked. Um, okay, but there's been an appeal. I think there are some of our folks that are not maintaining physical distance. Uh, I think St. Francis, and I'm also seeing here in the hub, my two gentlemen here. So they're saying, let's uh, keep our, our social, <laughs> We are, you know, we are social beings, so it's very hard, but let's try. Dr. Simwenda, Maureen, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just needed a clarification on um, the MCH uh, guideline, guidance. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chalilo mentioned that um, uh, the health promotion should be cancelled. I just need a clarification because as we mentioned this, we should not also lose out the opportunity uh, to give out uh, information on COVID-19 in the MCH. Okay, so uh, Dr. Bobo, are you still on? Maybe you can give guidance on that one. But I'll keep looking for it, can I see? Dr. Bobo, there's a question about not giving health promotion in our SMCH. What's 
what's the rationale behind the guidance or do we have any other innovative ways of doing health promotion? Unfortunately, she's dropped out, I can't see. You want somebody else to pick it up? Do we have anyone from the child health unit? Okay, Dr. Bobo, please go ahead and uh, give us further guidance on the on us stopping health promotion uh, messages in in MCH. So unfortunately, Dr. Bobo seems to have dropped out, but we'll get feedback next week if you. Okay, um, I think there was a question here, Dr. Chungu. Uh, Dr. Kalima, you seem to be breaking. I think people want to hear you talk about physical distance again. Hello? Um, okay, so when we started uh, talking about IPT, one of the things that was talked about was uh, social distancing, uh, the measure of so they revised the term and they're now saying that for what they actually want to do is maintaining that one meter distance. Well, at the same time, keeping in touch with each other, encouraging each other, because things that they want to turn in order to touch interaction with our students. And I hope that was clear. Essentially, saying we should continue being social media crazy, but don't go near each other. Professor Mtavalwani, there's a question here. How does your mother breastfeed without being in close contact? <laughs> 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 Thank you, Professor Mtavalwani. Sorry. 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 Do we have anything else? I guess at this point, there was a question on your... Dr. Your, Dr. Bobo. Dr. Mpeta. Hello. Hi, Dr. Bobo. Oh, yes. No, I have been here. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to answer to uh, the, the question that was asked by Dr. Smenda. One of the things that we're trying to prevent is congestion. And uh, if you've noted, uh, what hap usually happens when there's a session is that they like to keep a lot of people in a specific uh, space and give these um, health promotive talks. So what we're trying to encourage is that as they're seeing the patients, they can actually talk to them and give them the information that they need. But we are discouraging a situation whereby they keep people, a lot of people in one space and keep them for a long time to take them through a specific topic. And this is what usually happens. So I hope you've understood the differences. Okay, Dr. Simenda, is that okay, Dr. Maureen? I think the idea is to avoid people congregating and making a large crowd. I guess if they are fine, you can still do your health promotion talk as, as long as you are a meter away, they are a meter apart. I think that's what she said. So we are, we'll take, Two more questions because I'm overrunning and I need to go back to the call. Dr. Marsden? Yes. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, my question is for Dr. Lorenzo, and please excuse me if I'm asking something that was already discussed because my uh, I couldn't hear some of the, the, the thing which was breaking. But um, I was just following on on um, Dr. Chawala's question. So like if we looked at the paper that was in pediatrics at the, that looked at uh, the epidemiological uh, characteristics that came out and you know I think for some of us pediatricians were a bit more excited because it gave us a bit more information. Um, for your patients in Italy, other than the infants um, that were presenting with a picture of more of a septicemic picture, you know, like with, with the Chinese paper, they said there were patients with mild, moderate, severe, and critical symptoms, and most of them were either mild or moderate, meaning they were presenting with mainly like chorizo symptoms if they were mild. But I noted that on the paper, they had said that uh, the kids with um, moderate symptoms, some of them would have wheezing. So um, I know you said that in the kids with that you had seen um, in Italy with wheezing, uh, with bronchiolitis did not have COVID, but I'm wondering whether, did you see any children who just had like viral induced wheezy episodes um, who were also uh, COVID positive? Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, the, the paper in pediatrics uh, collected a big number of uh, children from different institutions. So it is different uh, than, than uh, living in one center in a, in a highly epidemic area and seeing patients coming together. So they're uh, much less patients, uh, but probably you have a, you have a clearer picture. In, the, in, the, in that paper also, uh, there, there is a little bit of a problem because they included also children with uh, uh, not confirmed uh, uh, infection. If you look at the paper, there are two groups of patients. They, they um, talk about children, they pull them together in the abstract uh, and in the comments, uh, and, uh, and they find out quite a, uh, a group of patients with also severe disease. But at the end, if you look at the tables, you will see that the severe cases are those who did not have a confirmation of the infection. So it is also important, I think, to look at the paper carefully. Uh, if you look at a cohort uh, that was confirmed with a, with a positive test, uh, they were quite uh, mild. Also, they, they classified uh, mild and moderate and severe with a classification that would not fit my personal classification because moderate severe were children admitted with pneumonia, uh, and, but very few of them required oxygen. And, and, and despite that, they classi uh, the classification was moderate or severe. So I, ca I cannot exclude that there might be patients uh, with uh, wheezing triggered by COVID-19. But my impression is that the, the disease is an interstitial pneumonia, which actually I have seen in two of my patients, mild interstitial pneumonia. And, uh, and that to me is the main picture. But uh, the, my experience is relatively small, you know, 20 patients positive. So I cannot exclude that COVID-19 might also trigger uh, bronchiolitis or an obstructive uh, uh, problem. Thank you so much. Kozia, we'll, we'll let you say something. Dr. Ziambo, you are muted. Okay. He's not able to join. Uh, Donald, you have something to say? Salima. No, go ahead. It's, it's, it's okay. Uh, my question is to Dr. Lorenzo. I think, uh, I think we, we have thought what the comments are coming to the last speaking to people with uh, COVID 19 at the risk of their own health. Uh, we see so many cases like. Uh, so, sorry, Doctor, I cannot hear you. I, I think you should move to another microphone. No, it's off now. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying uh, we have learned what uh, Dr. Lee had done in coming together and the dollars and nurses and other healthcare coming together to help these people who are having questions. 
parts of this presentation, uh, some healthcare workers have had to call in sick as well. Um, are there any necessary ways to have the doctors to find ourselves in the same situation and how to reduce the risk of getting sick? And how to, mostly, how to reduce the risk of getting sick? I know probably have a lot of things that we need to do, so what are some of the things that we need to do? What are some of the things I, I'm sorry, but I think uh, I think I can I couldn't hear you. But maybe one of the chairperson can summarize the question. Yeah. So essentially, Dr. Kalima is asking, what are the risk factors that cause some of those healthcare workers to end up with COVID-19 and end up being sick? And what about those that never got sick? What are the factors? It says that is it the better quality PPE? Is it PPE failure? Is it people not putting on their PPE properly? Because sure. I know for us, <laughs> we talk to each other, don't think, oh, my friend could have failed in their PPE and they can give me COVID. So, what's your advice so that we don't have so many of our healthcare workers going down? Sorry, the risk factors for children to get infected or for the healthcare person? Healthcare right? workers. Healthcare workers. A healthcare what worker. Happened? Okay, uh, this is a very important point because uh, uh, both in China and in Italy, healthcare personnel uh, got infected in high percentage. In my hospital, 30% of the healthcare personnel got uh, sick with this disease. So I think this is really, really paramount. Um, it is very important to wear the PPE, meaning uh, it is very important to have the appropriate masks, uh, including the FFP2 masks. It is very important to have the guns and the eye protection uh, and to be very careful with contact and droplets. Uh, so uh, I think the risk fact, most, you know, most of the infections probably occurred uh, in the emergency department because initially they were not protected. So it is very important to, to set up a pre-triage, dividing immediately the patients into the suspected and unsuspected and to be very careful uh, until a swab is done and a test uh, gets back uh, either positive or negative. That is really very, very important. And I also uh, recommend to, uh, to do the tests to all the personnel in the hospital because uh, both the patients, ad admitted patients and healthcare personnel should have a swab. Uh, of course, you need, uh, you need resources. You need to have the possibility to do many swabs. But if you have one person among the healthcare personnel uh, getting infected and being asymptomatic, that's the case even in adults, you will spread the infection within the hospital. Uh, and, and another important issue that the healthcare uh, personnel can spread the infection when they go back home. Um, and for instance, what happens in Italy is that uh, often at home, there are the grandparents, there are elder people looking after the children, so uh, uh, what, what can happen is that the healthcare uh, personnel brings the infection to the elder people and the elder people really are at very high risk. Uh, so, so I think it is really important to uh, use the PPE and to do the swaps. Okay, thank you um, so much for that. I know somebody is saying something about stigma and COVID-19. We'll have a separate session on the psychological aspects of this disease, just so that we give a chance to the pediatric expert team here. Dr. Professor Tawalani, do you want to say something? Yes, I've got a question for Dr. My question is on the cytokine score. Are there any drugs that can be used to downgrade or down regulate the, the, the cytokine storm. And the case in point is the commonest drug that is available, particularly in developing countries, that the macrolides. Are they got any role in down regulating the cytokine storm? Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, at, at the moment, what is available? Well, I think we should say a word about steroids. Um, uh, patients with severe lung disease uh, had uh, had steroids. 
actually a small group of patients in China had steroids. And the, I don't know, their evaluation showed that in the first few days, the patients improved, but then somehow they, they found out um, that uh, actually these patients worsened uh, uh, later. So uh, the first recommendation was against the steroids. But I think we are realizing that steroids are very, very useful for patients with, uh, with interstitial pneumonia, so the, the very sick one. And actually we're using steroids for the cytokine storm, uh, full dose uh, for five days, which is, uh, let's say, one milligram per kilogram for five days, tapered down in the following 10 days. And this is a very simple, a very simple tool. Uh, but uh, we're also using biologic treatment. There is an anti anti-interleukin-6 drug, which is called tocilizumab, uh, which is used actually uh, in rheumatology and in hematology as well. Uh, this, uh, this appears to be effective in these patients. Uh, um, there, are, there are other options that are taken into consideration. For instance, anti-interleukin-1, which is called anakinra, uh, and another, another biologic that might be very useful. And, well, I have some experience with, uh, I have some experience with patients with inflammatory bowel disease. You know that these patients are on anti-TNF-alpha. And uh, if you look at the paper published in Lancet, you would see all the cytokines. So you would see that also TNF-alpha is very increased in these patients. So maybe in the future, but nobody started, I have to say, even anti-TNF-alpha can be, can be tried. So there are trials with immunomodulating uh, drugs. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that's very helpful. So we'll go back to our test for today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually overrunning today. I'm relaunching the polls and see how we will put. Okay. So let's go ahead and vote. According to the current evidence, mothers positive for COVID-19 can go ahead and breastfeed their infants. Okay. Dr. Chung, only 11 people are interested in your test now. <laughs> Dr. Lorenzo was too interesting, isn't it? I almost feel like you need to come back for another session as pediatricians, but <laughs> we, we, we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's practice social distance. I think Kanyama, we now have to call you out because we say social distance, physical distance. <laughs> I can't imagine somebody talking WhatsApp because you've been talking social distance. But it, according to the current evidence, mothers positive for COVID-19 can go ahead and breastfeed their infants. Dr. Chungu. So most people feel they can actually breastfeed, but there's 6% of our network feel that, no, 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 no. After what you've said about septic like cytokine form, what's your comment on this? Yeah, I've ended the call, <laughs> Any comments? So you still feel that they don't want to protect uh, mothers to receive? Oh, Dr. Madi, she's actually on. Dr. Yeah. Madi, do you want to help us with this poll? Professor Pavalani has volunteered you. I'm sure you can see I've shared the results of people's opinion. Dr. Mlenga? Okay, then Dr. Dr. Veronica Mlenga, any comments? Dr. Professor Mpavalani, unfortunately, I think it's fallen back. Sorry, on. hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I was having problems and muting myself. I think uh, maybe those who are still not convinced are worried about uh, contact, uh, physical contact with their babies. But um, I think uh, breastfeeding and the nutrition that a baby will get from the mom, and especially a new baby, is so important that uh, you need to take time to counsel the mother and uh, teach them about uh, infection prevention measures and uh, make sure they are, that they have the necessary protective uh, clothing that they need in order for them to, to breastfeed. 
Thank you. I hope that's clear to our 5%. Otherwise, I think 95% is they should go ahead and breastfeed these babies. I'll go out on a limb and say probably there are some even antibodies in that breast milk. Don't quote me. I haven't done a study. Okay, so we are going to our second poll question. And um, I have to relaunch it. Sorry. So here we are regarding immunizations. Dr. Bobo, I hope you are, you are ready. Which of these is correct? Immunization services should be stopped due to risk of transmission of COVID-19. Immunization should only be offered at hospitals. Routine weighing of children should be done on all the kids. Uh, MCH should be reorganized in order to decongest facilities and provide services in a safe manner. None of the above. So yeah, you got Dr. Chungu, do you want to comment before I end the poll? We do not have enough people calling in. We want to hear everyone's opinion. Okay, so this is interesting. Yes. I would imagine if you stop immunization for something like measles, that mm. has an amount of 16. Or polio. Actually, <laughs> or polio. Very, uh, yeah. Okay, so any, any share? Okay. So this is how we polled mm -hmm. the 85 of us that are obedient. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's good. I mean, it means that the, the, the case in point is that our facilities should reopen. Yeah, so we need to be also innovative there as long as we are within the guidelines of the, the Ministry of Health. Don't see too many people at the same time. Of course, if you need to weigh the ones that look edematous and severely malnourished, those, of course, need the weight. So, okay. We will have our last poll. Unfortunately, we have to close. We actually overrun. You can go ahead with it. That was a question. Uh, can the breastfeeding mother who has just the first ah, That's breast milk now, not intrauterine, eh? because that's also another discussion. Should we ask Dr. Lorenzo that? Their experience, or do people want to talk about the literature? And then we can ask Dr. Lorenzo. Can you remember? My one? Yes, yes, guys. Hello? So, uh, concerning the question if a uh, breastfeeding mother who has tested positive uh, can transmit by infection to a breastfeeding, current evidence from China uh, and uh, <coughs> From the WHO, was that there was no viral, there was no virus associated with the hospital. The hospital. Okay, Dr. Lorenzo, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. Um, I can, I can tell you what the, the neonatal society uh, decided and published also as a recommendation. So the current recommendation for breastfeeding are that, uh, that breastfeeding is allowed from um, positive mothers to, to newborns. Uh, so it is fine to breastfeed. If the mother is unwell with COVID-19, uh, the child can be fed with expressed milk so still breastfeeding should be, should be favored. And uh, of course, this should be carried out with, uh, with droplet and contact uh, measures. Okay, but the other question is, can uh, the virus be transmitted through breast milk? Uh, there is no evidence that the virus is transmitted through breast milk. Okay. Okay, so for three is um, interesting, Dr. <laughs> Chungu. Sorry, uh, I have to apologize, but uh, I think for me it's time to go because uh, oh, wow. I have my own meetings uh, and, and also patients on the ward that have to go on the ward bound. Thank you so, so much. That was so helpful, so mind opening. Thank you very much. We're actually winding up. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank you. It was really a great pleasure to share with you my experience and listen to your experience on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo. Thank you, Dr. Chikoni. 
and Dr. goodbye. Tikon. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tikon, for inviting Dr. Lorenzo. Thank you, Kozia, for organizing. So this is our last <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was a bit sorry, uh, late for a meeting. Anyway, Lorenzo, I think, is gone. And so for me, it was really a pleasure. Congratulations to, to, for all of you, for Dr. Chungo, for the presentation. <laughs> I think uh, now I have also to go, you know, it's always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> I feel back a bit in Zambia. <laughs> thank okay, you so thank much. You, Giselle, Tony. Thank you, stay safe. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So concerning the management of asthma and COVID-19, which of the following is correct? Which one is true? Inhaled steward should not be used. Nebulization should be encouraged. Use of metered dose inhalers with or without spacers should be recommended. Two weekly reviews should be encouraged to reduce acute exacerbation of asthma or of the above. Dr. Chungu, before we wind up. Okay, so for there, the recommendation is really to use spacers as much as possible. Remember what we said that using nebulizers generates a lot of aerosols. And you need to do that safely uh, with uh, proper infection prevention. So I know sometimes we share nebulizers among patients. And so that, that really, if we can use spacers and we use them well, most, most children will really get out of their attacks. So we really need to be meticulous with uh, uh, the, the respiratory hygiene using nebulizers and protect each other. Also, it can be done in a closed space, not in an open ward, like so that we protect uh, not only healthcare workers but also the other patients. You know. Okay, and we should continue to use inhaled steroids. Yes, inhaled steroids will prevent a breakthrough attack. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to share the results, and as we do that, I have actually overrun. I'm actually marked by. <laughs> my time, but Doc, we'll allow Professor Tabalwani to just pause for us and summarize. All right. Uh, thank you very much for having organized this presentation. The COVID team in UTH have done a commendable job. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Tungu for having taken us through all the slides. The take home message is physical distancing. What social trust? <laughs> narrow down the social distance. Keep in touch with our relatives, our neighbors, and our friends. Thank you very much to you all. Yeah, thank you, Professor. And just thank you to the Echo family for giving us this uh, short, uh, we know you have a schedule and all, but just this short timeline. Thank you to really Dr. Skarima Mumba and Dr. Mwinga for just your time on this and the entire uh, Zambia Pediatric Association, the program managers at Ministry of Health, our president, Dr. Mwene Chanya, Sister Chikoni, for really giving us an insight into the front lines and, and really just having this experience where we get so much input. Uh, Chembo, uh, the CDC team, Dr. Mary Boyd, uh, Dr. Hines, as well as Meg, for all your comments. It, it really just shows how that if we really work together, really we achieve, we achieve a lot and we're stronger together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taliloya. Let's just remember for children, the epidemiological link is actually critical. If they are coming from a hot zone, swab them, even if they look fine and cute. So we'll see you next week. We are looking at the literature review of most of the studies that have come to the COVID-19 um, outbreak. We'll do it in two parts because there's so much literature out there. Some in predatory journals, some in peer-reviewed journals. So we'll be looking at that. Thank you so much.